Well, and it's time that I will bring all of you to the panel discussions, and that discussion will show us the key role of collaborations in creating circular economy. And the topics for the forthcoming panel discussion today is accelerating circular economy through collaboration. And may I kindly invite the moderator of the panel discussion, Mr. Brandon Eckerthand, Circular Economy Director, World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Please welcome. Well, please give a big round of applause. As I mentioned, my name is Brendan Edgerton, the director of the Circular Economy Program for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, welcome to the session on accelerating the circular economy through collaboration. Uh, I have the privilege of being the moderator for uh, the next hour. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with WBCSD, uh, we are a CEO-led uh, nonprofit organization of around 200 companies. And those 200 companies collectively commit to a world in which 9 billion people live well within the means of the planet. Uh, on behalf of WBCSD, uh, I'd like to thank SCG uh, for having us here again this year and participating. It's been, they've been a great partner in our Factor 10 program on circular economy uh, and, and very, very much appreciate having the chance to come back here. Uh, at WBCSD, we often reference this common saying that I'm sure many of you have heard, that uh, to go fast, you go alone, uh, and to go far, you must go together. And uh, this brings us to the point of this session, collaboration, uh, and how key it is in order to accelerate uh, the circular economy. Uh, for years, companies, organizations, and even governments uh, have been moving alone and trying to move fast to address these very urgent issues. Uh, but in doing so, and in maintaining this introverted perspective of trying to secure competitive advantage or demonstrate leadership, uh, we haven't always been able to uh, assess whether our individual activities are moving the needle as much as they should be, or as much as we see today they need to be. And increasingly, uh, what we must do in order to solve some of these challenges like climate change, uh, like pollution, like human rights violations, uh, is to work together and to work across sectors, work across value chains, and even work with our competitors uh, in order to address some of these major issues. Uh, the circular economy is, is, as I mentioned, absolutely no uh, exception to this. Uh, and in many cases, circular economy really depends on collaboration in order to be effective. Uh, not only do the companies and organizations participating in circular economy need to maintain this whole life cycle perspective, uh, but it is critical to not only identify the right partners, but work with them in an effective way in order to make it a success. So, my job today is purely as moderator, set the scene, but we have four stellar panelists that will join and each share, uh, present about five minutes of their individual uh, collaborations and initiatives that they're involved in. We'll have a Q&A. And as, as, as you guys just participated in the app, uh, submitting your objectives, uh, we will have a moment after each panelist uh, has had a time to present their initiative for each of you guys to submit your questions uh, and we'll take a, a subset of those and, and uh, it, uh, speak to them uh, later on in the session. So with that, let's get to our panelists. Uh, first, we have Craig Buckholz. I invite him up to the stage now. He is the Chief Communications Officer of Procter & Gamble. He will be representing the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. Craig is charged with building and protecting the reputation of P&G and company's portfolio of iconic brands. Uh, Craig joined P&G after leading communications organizations and projects uh, such as at Merck and Johnson & Johnson. Uh, uh, next to him, I'd invite Benjamin Sporton. Please join us on stage. He is the chief executive of the Global Cement and Concrete Association. Mr. Sporton started his role as GCCA's first chief executive about a year ago in October. He leads the GCCA executive team in efforts to drive advances in sustainable construction, working to enhance cement and concrete industries' contribution to sustainable development. 
I would also like to invite Graham Holder, Project Coordinator, Circular Economy for Flexible Packaging, CFLEX. He's a Managing Director of Sloop Consulting, which has been offering consulting services and tools in the field of packaging and sustainability since 2009. And then lastly, I'd like to invite Don, Dr. Kongrapan Intarajan uh, to the stage. He's the Chief Operating Officer Upstream Petrochemicals Business at BTT Global Chemical, PLC. Uh, Dr. Kongrapan uh, was appointed CEO in 2017 after being its Executive Vice President, uh, International Business Operations. He holds multiple board positions and received his Doctorate of Philosophy in Chemical Engineering from the University of Houston. So. Enough of me speaking. Craig, I'd like to hand it over to you to discuss a little bit more about the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. Great, thank you, uh, and thank you all for being here, and thank you very much for the invitation and to SCG for hosting uh, us here today. So the Alliance to End Plastic Waste is really a first of its kind CEO uh, cross-value chain initiative that is really focused on eliminating plastic waste in the environment. What's happened is, at current, 39 different companies have come together with a singular focus, and those companies represent really the full value chain of plastics, as we call it, whether that's uh, manufacturing plastic, whether that's using plastic, whether that's collecting it, whether it's uh, converting it. Anybody that's, that touches plastic is, is welcome to be part of this uh, consortium. And what these companies have done is pledged $1.5 billion over the next five years to fund innovative solutions and bring to scale ways that we can eliminate plastic waste in the environment. Um, and they're doing that by focusing on four very specific areas, innovation, infrastructure, education, and cleanup. The Alliance is relatively young. We launched it in just January of this year, so it's about eight or nine months old. But in that period of time, we've really got some significant momentum. Last week, we announced our new CEO, who is joining us from the United Nations. We've worked hard to actually put in place the infrastructure of this nonprofit organization. We've begun the process of screening projects that have been submitted to us, so far over 400. We've made some selections on funding some projects across that innovation, infrastructure, education, and cleanup system. Uh, and we look forward to many, many more things to come. Fantastic, thank you, Craig. Uh, we'll have uh, questions right after this. We're we'll gonna do a little more detail. Uh, and again, please, if you have any questions, submit them through the app. Uh, we'll continue right on down the line to Benjamin, if you could uh, provide some thoughts about the GCCA. Hi, Craig. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, fantastic to be here. I do have a couple of slides. There we go. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you the Global Cement and Concrete Association, which is a new organization that's been set up to represent the cement and concrete uh, industries internationally. We started our operations in October uh, last year. We are working towards representing at least half of the uh, global cement production capacity. Uh, very proud to have around about 40 companies Companies as members of ours at the moment and very proud indeed to have uh, SCG as one of our uh, initiating uh, members. We have been set up really with three core strategic objectives. Uh, first of all, to work on sustainability, uh, both in cement manufacturing but uh, also in the use of concrete. Uh, to work on innovation, uh, again, in cement manufacturing. How can we reduce emissions uh, from cement production? Uh, how can we look at innovating in uh, new strategies for the circular economy uh, in cement production? Uh, but also innovation in building and construction and the application of concrete. And finally, then, to position concrete as a sustainable building material by having done all of that work on sustainability uh, and innovation across our value chain. So those are the three core objectives uh, of the Global Cement and Concrete Association. We are uh, founded on and founded on a commitment of, uh, to sustainability. Uh, our predecessor initiative is uh, 
an, an initiative called the Cement Sustainability Initiative that was part of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. This is something that cement producers uh, all around the world have uh, been operating for uh, 15 or 20 years before they actually decided to shift that work from the Cement Sustainability Initiative into the Global Cement and Concrete Association. So this is a really long-standing uh, initiative and piece of work uh, from our industry. Uh, part of the work of the Cement Sustainability Initiative was actually to run something called the Getting the Numbers Right database. Uh, this is a reporting database and it's fairly unique uh, globally to actually collect data from the industry to look at uh, performance around uh, CO2 emissions, use of alternative fuels. Um, it has a, a, quite a number of metrics that actually help measure the sustainability performance uh, of our industry and it's something that we are really focusing on continuing uh, at the Global Cement and Concrete Association and we took over that work on the 1st of January. Part of our foundation is a, a sustainability charter. That sustainability charter has five key pillars uh, and it will be no surprise to any of you to notice that uh, circular economy is one of those core five pillars. The industry is really committed to, to doing a lot of work on this. We've already uh, established a set of sustainability guidelines for co-processing of fuels and raw materials in cement manufacturing. Uh, these are best practice guidelines and they're guidelines for monitoring and reporting. So we make sure that we collect data, uh, particularly around the use of alternative fuels. And we also are in the process of developing guidelines for uh, reuse and recycling of concrete. Uh, so this is something that uh, we're in the process of developing right now and hopefully be able to launch uh, later this year and that will contain performance metrics around things like the percentage of concrete that's actually returned, that's recovered and, and then reused. The industry is already actually uh, achieving quite a lot here uh, and in fact we've had an eight-fold increase in the use of alternative fuels uh, which in many cases is uh, co-processing and taking waste uh, from other industries and then using that in our, our cement kilns. So it's something the industry is already doing quite a lot of and uh, working to improve and obviously we want to keep on working on that so sharing best practice and expertise is, is absolutely critical in that. And in the work that we're doing, we're looking at how we can apply the waste hierarchy to uh, some of our activities. So if we look at the waste hierarchy, we start with prevention and reduction. And so how do we not over-design buildings to not use too much concrete in the first place? So the BIM model, the building information models, is, is just one way of looking at that. How do we reuse? Can we recycle concrete? Can we actually reuse buildings that are built out of concrete, repurpose them? So a, a building that's built as a hospital today can become a school or something something else tomorrow. Uh, these are just some of the, the things that we're thinking about collaborating with designers, architects, engineers uh, as we, we build our work program going forward and I'm sure we can explore some more of that uh, through the panel discussion. Fantastic. Thank you, Benjamin. I'll pass it on to Graham to share a little bit more about CFLEX. Good uh, morning and uh, thank you very much to SCG for this uh, fantastic opportunity to tell you about a project that is going on in Europe uh, to recycle flexible packaging uh, and return those materials back to the economy. We call this our mission circular. Uh, it's a collaboration of the entire flexible packaging value chain and when I say entire I mean the full uh, flexible packaging value chain, and I'll come to some more details later. Uh, what we, the way we're going to do this is by designing better packaging and better end-of-life systems that collect, sort, and recycle those materials back into materials that we can actually use again. Uh, and by doing so, we hope that we can uh, further enhance the, um, uh, the performance of flexible packaging in the circular economy. We made a, uh, a short video uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I think this will give you a much better idea as to what CFLEX is trying to achieve in, uh, in Europe. Flexible packaging is an important part of our modern world. It protects food and other goods and is generally made of plastics, but can also include other materials such as paper or aluminium foil. This helps ensure products reach consumers safe and fresh, preserving nutrition, taste and quality. It reduces waste of the goods it protects and often uses far less material than alternative packaging. 
Being very light and thin, flexible packaging reduces the environmental impact of transportation. The qualities that make it so useful, lightweight and resource efficient also present a challenge. The financial incentives for collection and recycling of post-consumer flexible packaging are currently less compelling when compared to many heavier packaging alternatives. And like all products, when disposed incorrectly, it can end up as litter. Many companies and organizations associated with flexible packaging in Europe recognize the need to transform the linear economy of take, make and dispose and have taken leadership to address this challenge by joining the C-Flex initiative to deliver a circular economy for flexible packaging. The circular economy we are committed to being part of avoids waste and pollution by redesigning consumer flexible packaging and also provides appropriate collection and recycling infrastructure in all European countries. This will enable used flexible packaging to be cost effectively recovered and the resources returned to the economy to be used again and again. Seaflex is a growing collective of over 130 companies and organizations representing all parts of the value chain connected to flexible packaging. Our aim is to enable collection of all flexible packaging and recycle 80% of it into new valuable materials, becoming either new packaging or flowing back into the wider circular economy. Our vision is a Europe where flexible packaging is integral to a truly circular and sustainable future. Together, this is our mission circular to create multiple lives for flexible packaging materials. So, uh, that said it in a lot quicker than I could have done that. Uh, who are we? We're uh, probably close to 140 uh, participating companies and associations. We believe we're, uh, we represent more than 80% of the flexible packaging which is being put onto the, flex, uh, onto the European market today. Uh, we are privileged to have uh, all those companies, but including four out of the top five global FMCG companies. Uh, four out of the six top polyolefin producers uh, and many of the leading players from the uh, end of life uh, and the machinery side of uh, flexible packaging. Uh, just to get an idea of uh, how uh, much traction we're getting in the market, we added up the, uh, the turnover of all of these companies and it uh, is growing to an impressive 1.2 trillion euros this year. We haven't stopped growing, there's a lot of interest, um, and uh, uh, it's important for us because although we don't want to have thousands of people joining CFLEX, we do need thousands of companies to take what we generate and implement it. Our target, as we said, was to collect all flexible packaging so that it doesn't leak into the natural environment, and then to return 80% of that uh, into materials that uh, can find their way back into the market. Uh, we would like to see a world in which, uh, and starting in Europe, where all flexible packaging is designed so that it can effectively be uh, collected, sorted, and recycled. The big challenge is the development of sustainable end market applications for these materials. And when I say sustainable, that means we're doing a circular economy, but it also has to be good for the planet at the same time, and that the people doing this have to actually be able to do this without going out of business. So it has to be profitable for them. And we see that as one of the key missing pieces of the puzzle. Uh, what we're talking about out of the 24 million tons of plastic going onto the European market is that blue box over there. It's 3.7 million tons, although we suspect that gray box might also be leaking into the blue box. The good news is that over 80% of that blue box uh, is monomaterials, and I'm pretty sure it's a similar here in Thailand, that should be relatively easy to recycle back into usable products. The, the difficult part, which uh, everybody normally refers to, is that 20% yellow box on the right-hand side over there. Uh, those are more challenging, but there are solutions that we can actually, that we already have to recycle those materials. We've... Uh, agreed five simple steps in the process to get there. Firstly, it's collection. Secondly, you have to design the packs uh, so that they are easier to sort and recycle. 
Thirdly, uh, we need to redesign our multi-materials so that we have end-of-life solutions for them uh, and put in place, and the fourthly, the, uh, the, uh, the mechanisms to do that. And uh, fifthly, we have to make sure that there are end markets for these materials because without the end markets, it's not going to happen. We've had these five steps approved by all of our stakeholders and we've underpinned them with a set of actions that uh, for each part of the value chain that we see as being essential to delivering the circular economy. That's our mission circular. Um, these are the people who work with me uh, to help deliver this and I've included it so you have some contact details uh, if you're interested uh, after this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham. We'll hand over there to Dr. Kongrapan. I believe you have some slides as well to introduce uh, a little bit from PTT's perspective. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, in PTT Global Chemical or GC, we integrated um, the sustainability concept into our day-to-day -day business. So we have been um, you know, in top 10 of the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for the past many years. Uh, but the two key elements that are the most relevant to us are the climate strategy and the, you know, the circular economy. If you move to the next slide, um, you can see that um, in the circular economy or, and in GC, since we integrated into day-to-day -day work, we call it circular living. So we want our employees to, besides working in the company when they go home, they also apply this concept into their you know, family and day-to-day -day living. Um, and in the three aspects, right, from smart operating, responsible, caring, and loop connecting, I can give you some examples of what we are doing. First of all, in, since we are um, a producer of um, chemical and petrochemical, the operation part plays the most important role. And there are many ways that we can do in, in order to reduce the greenhouse gas, so on and so forth. But um, I think the most important thing is to set a target as a corporate. So we have a clear target to follow the um, the UN uh, target and also a sub-target for um, petrochemical and chemical sector. If you look at the bottom of the, the picture, uh, we started this in 2012 in order to measure and we plan to reduce the greenhouse gas um, emission by 20% from the BAU. But then in 2050, we target to reduce um, by 52% in terms of intensity. In the next step, um, for the second part, next slide please. Um, in responsible caring, and this thing we are doing a lot of things with many, many partners. Um, we have a target in 2030 in our chemical portfolio we want to have performance and green uh, products by 30% of our total portfolios. This is an ambitious target, but it's something doable. By talking about green chemicals, we have invested in this um, part of business for the past 10 years. We started with building blocks of um, biochemical and also several R&D startups uh, mainly in the U.S. So all in all, we, we want to reduce our um, conventional petrochemical portfolios and have 30% green and performance products. And in all our products, our ambition is to have the um, carbon footprint reduction. So we do the LCA, the labeling, and we want to achieve all of our products very soon. The last slide, I think, is probably the most important and most relevant for today's meeting in terms of loop connecting and collaboration. You know, maybe the, the, the logos are too small, but in the bottom part of the chart, there are many institutes, companies, and partners that we, are, we have been working together. Um, 
one of very famous thing that we have done is to do upcycling. You know, we start with the project. You know, people told us to do things with the ocean is probably most challenging. So we collected um, plastic bottles from Summit Island around that area, which is close to where we base and produce, and we upcycle it into, you know, fabrics to clothes to higher value products. You know, create. You know, we try to, um, you know, change the recycle concept. Right? People might not want to use recycled products because of the perception of the value, but by upcycling it, make it more fashionable, make it more valuable, then people you know, start to gain momentum and use it. And then we also you know, have a plan by the next five years, we will phase out all our products that go into single-use plastics. On top of that, 20% of the products that has potential to go into waste, we're gonna do recycle. So we're gonna make recycle plant in Thailand, Re recycling PET and high, high density polyethylene into more value products. So these are what we have been doing, and you know, hopefully we play an important part of all this sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kogopan. Uh, great, thank you to all the panelists for sharing about your respective initiatives. Uh, just as a reminder to please submit your questions via the app. Uh, in the poll section there of the app, you'll be able to submit those and we'll be getting those coming through in a moment here. Uh, but maybe before going to the audience questions, uh, come back to Craig. And with the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, uh, you know, what, what was the catalyst or what drew P&G to joining that initiative? There are many initiatives in plastics uh, out there right now, but what drew particularly your leadership uh, yeah. in jumping in? I think uh, it's about making specific choices. So for some time, Procter & Gamble has been on this journey of really trying to tell the story of a company that is a force for good and a force for growth uh, in the world. And uh, within the context of being a force for good, to your very point, Brennan, there's a lot of things uh, that a company like Procter & Gamble can connect itself to. But I think what we were inspired by uh, is, is this notion of being part of something that perhaps really will allow us to get after this intractable problem. Uh, because of the way the alliance is structured, because of the fact that it's cross-value chain, because of the fact that it's CEO-led, because of the fact that there's $1.5 billion being put into it, and because of the fact that we want to do it in five years. Uh, so it's really taking all of the benefits of these companies that we're partnering with, bringing them to the table, and asking the question very specifically, how do we eliminate plastic waste in the environment, and how do we bring the best, best and brightest minds to that, and how do we take those solutions and bring them to scale. So I think it was this notion of really being part of something that, that can get at this intractable problem. Great. Okay, that's great, thank you. To Benjamin and Graham, uh, you guys are each working on initiatives, um, bringing companies together and trying to move towards a shared vision. What was it about your respective initiatives that catalyze getting these companies to commit and, and joining something like that, whether it's an independent organization or a separate uh, project in itself. Let me start with Benjamin. Well, I think as a CEO-led initiative as well, the Global Cement and Concrete Association was established because our CEOs recognize that they, their companies are both part of the problem uh, that we have in the world, but also part of the solution. And so wanting to be able to collaborate and work together, share ideas around best practices, uh, new initiatives and experiences that uh, operate in our member companies that are all around the world to come together, share their experience and best practice, uh, and work out how we can all uh, implement new strategies to address some of our challenges. But also because we uh, initially were set up through the Cement Sustainability Initiative, that's our precursor initiative, and uh, that was very much focused purely on the cement side of the spectrum. Um, but cement, as you know, is a key ingredient for con uh, concrete, and we really needed to be working across the value chain. It's through working across the value chain that we can actually have the most 
impact. So uh, how can we look at uh, the way that cement manufacturing impacts on the use of concrete, um, working with others in the, in the value chain, for example, uh, designers and engineers. Uh, that's really an important part of the work that we'll be doing at, at the GCCA. And I think that's why uh, the CEOs of our member companies really wanted the initiative to be set up so that we could share all of that experience and then work with other stakeholders through the value chain. It's a very good question that you pose. Um, and uh, uh, I think the reason why CFLEX has uh, been an attractive proposition for stakeholders like PNG, like SCG, but lots of other big companies, uh, is because they've tried to do it themselves. They, we instinctively know what we need to do, uh, and we try and do it, but we find there are lots of reasons why we can't do this by ourselves. CFLEX is really looking at taking some of these high-level initiatives and working out how to do it in practice. And uh, that's why I think our stakeholders come to CFLEX. We've never marketed it. Uh, we get people coming to us saying, we want to be part of this discussion. We want to understand what we can do. We want to understand how we can design our, our polymers, our packs, uh, uh, the additives that go into that to make them circular. Uh, and at the same time, we want to be part, we, we realize that we need the whole value chain to move as one. We're doing this for Europe. Uh, a lot of the, the things that will come out for Europe will be quite relevant in other regions of the world. Uh, Europe happens to enjoy uh, extended producer responsibility, uh, which enables us to fund some of the things that are more difficult to fund in other regions. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that uh, um, some of the work that we're doing will be adopted in other regions, um, and uh, uh, we hope that we continue to grow. Um, and we are making significant progress. It's going to take us another uh, probably one and a half years to have the vision rounded out, and then another uh, two, three, maybe four years to, to hopefully have put it in practice in Europe. Great. Thank you, Graham. And back down to Dr. Congrepen. You had a nice list of logos down at the bottom that I'm not sure everyone could see, um, but it was extensive and, uh, you know, highlighting the importance of the collaboration and, and how, uh, how much collaboration is required for one initiative. How did you go about identifying which organizations or companies you wanted to work with and, and then begin to prioritize them? Well, great question. But um, before that, right, we need to, just like a lot of other things, you have to have belief and commitment yourself first. Mm -hmm. So before we go out and, you know, create all these partnerships, we need to really make sure that internally we are aligned. Mm -hmm. And we don't just do this for a short term, but it has to be sustainable, right? So, um, you know, it, it takes some time. It's not easy. It, it's like everything else. You, know, you need diligence. You need to create all this thing internally. Once we are firm that you know all aspects of our organization is ready, then we go out. And it starts with um, identifying key strategic partners, key thought leaders, and certain business. We start with something close to us first. You know, someone like if we do upcycling, we go to you know to work with designer, to work with companies that are doing this fabric and the fashion, and then you know once you know we have this group of collaborators, they start to gain the share values, right? They they trust us and they also engaged, and once that share value is there then one thing leads to another. You know, the, the momentum is, the momentum starts and, you know, there, there are multiplier effects, you know. So our friends, getting their friends to join us. So, and this is something we really want to happen, right? We want to incubate these thoughts and at the end of the day, we might not be the most important part of it, but, you know, ev everything expands. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Okay, so uh, hopefully we have a bunch of questions in the app right now. Before we go to that, because I don't see anything on my screen yet, uh, one more round of questions. I think this one's going to be applicable to everybody. And, oh, there we go. 
Uh, well, I'm going to ask this question anyways, because I kind of want to get some insights in the answer. Collaboration isn't always easy, right? And uh, it could often be a, a headache, a challenge, but uh, you, know, you go through it because of that end goal, the vision that, that you guys are all working towards. Within each of your respective initiatives or partnerships, could you give a glimpse of some of the challenges that, you, uh, that others should anticipate if they were to set up similar types of initiatives working with others? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this seems uh, really elementary, but it's the complexity uh, and really understanding the complexity that um, multi-partner initiatives really entail. And I think for the Alliance and Plastic Waste, one of the things that became really evident early on was uh, the propensity to potentially understand, not necessarily with like-minded people like those in this room, but the world writ large, uh, is to understate the, the, the state of the problem, but to overstate what any one of us could actually do. And so it's this systems approach, and it's really understanding how you bring a number of companies together. For us, it's 39, and hopefully that number is going to grow. But because it's across the value chain, you really have to stay focused on, on what is the shared values and what are the shared mission uh, without drifting. And I think the bigger a, a partnership or a consortium gets, obviously, the more complex that gets and the more attenuated some of the spaces you want to go. So I think it's making sure that it's very clear and it's very precise what the objective is and bringing everybody back to that uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Yeah, that's great. I suppose for a, a new organization like ours, it's the sheer sort of range of issues and stakeholders that we, we have to work with uh, and identifying which of those are the most critical and which of those we can have the most impact on. And that's actually why uh, I think one of the first sets of guidelines that we actually implemented was the waste co-processing guidelines uh, for our uh, cement manufacturing sustainability guidelines. But uh, I think as we, we move forward and we try and operate further down our value chain, um, the stakeholders that we can work with uh, to improve things like building information management systems, uh, designing to reduce the use of concrete or to repurpose buildings, uh, that, that is certainly something that we're going to focus on and is going to be a really big challenge for us. So uh, we're looking forward to it, but uh, I think the stakeholders are, are really important to identify and work with. Very good. The, um I think the, the biggest barrier that we're coming into contact with now is we've got some scale, but to be successful, we need the whole industry, uh, the whole society to change to a new way. And it's simply the scale of that change that I think when you embark on a sustainable project like CFLEX, that you have no idea as to how big it is. And how do you move from pilot into mainstream? That's extremely difficult. The second thing is the um, uh, identifying what's missing, why it doesn't work today. And really, it's about making those available, those materials, recycled materials available, and making sure that there's enough demand for them, that they can compete with virgin materials at the same quality and maybe even make them a little bit cheaper so that people like Craig want to buy lots of them. Um, so those are for me the two uh, big challenges that uh, I see in terms of scaling projects to make them circular and sustainable. Okay, I think I mentioned a little bit, but the challenges is probably us, right? I think we, you know, internally we need to really step up and share the core value before we go out. All the other aspects of collaboration, I think it's part of the work that we need to do, right? But I think we have to start with ourselves. Very good. Okay, well, we have some questions and a, and a bit of democracy on our hands as well as some of these are being upvoted. So making it a little bit easier for us to identify which ones the audience is keen to uh, hear. Um, I might save the first one for a moment um, and go down to the second one as it's a little more pointed for Mr. Holder. Uh, how can you replace the multi-layer packaging? This is a very easy question. I'm sure you can answer this in 20 it, seconds it, uh, since it cannot be recycled, reused, and, and uh, dumping is typical. Well, it's absolutely not true 
that they cannot be recycled. Uh, we have mechanisms to recycle these materials. Uh, we're working on making those mechanisms cheaper to implement and more widely available. Um, the first is we need to collect them. They're only 20% of the stream. For most countries, that 20% doesn't even justify the uh, investment in a, a manufacturing facility. So we do actually need uh, to probably uh, share this small quantity of more challenging materials uh, and put the investment in place at a scale at which uh, we can afford to recycle them cost-effectively or economically. Uh, so uh, um, we need multi-materials. Um, they, uh, they protect uh, food and other products which have a far bigger impact uh, on the resources and on the carbon footprint should those not be delivered and used as they were supposed to be. So we don't want to design them out. If they're not necessary, let's use a, a mono-material solution. But there are lots of applications where they are simply indispensable. They're also by far the most resource efficient uh, solution. So we need them, um, but we do need to find a way to get them back. Very good. Uh, we'll go to the, the first one now. How are we going to deal with increasing the cost or the increasing cost uh, when, by moving towards a circular economy? Uh, does anyone have thoughts that jump to mind first, Dr. Kangapan? Yeah, um, sometimes this is a misconception. I think by integrating this circular economy in your business, sometimes it's even reduced cost, right? And besides reducing cost, it also helps, you know, generating or penetrating into new markets also. So I think that's, that's my thoughts. Very good. Maybe uh, I'll just add, you know, we, we did some research with our members a couple years back and found uh, eight reasons, eight different reasons of why companies are moving towards circularity. Um, one of them is the, the cost reduction and, and capturing new markets. Um, you have a risk mitigation element there uh, that's interesting to some. Uh, there are also people also finding that it's helping them maintain and, or improve relationships with their customers uh, or even help in attracting and retaining talent. So there's many different value drivers that uh, you can pull through the circular economy uh, to off offset any costs if there are any associated with that project. Um, can, I, can I chip in on that? Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> The big challenge here uh, for costs is when you're doing it by yourself and you're at a cost disadvantage to your competition. If you do this as a value chain, uh, as society, and everybody has the same costs, you're not at a disadvantage. We do have to get used to uh, paying the full cost for the packaging, the plastics, and concretes and everything else that we, we use, these resources for our planet. Uh, and that has to be priced in. In Europe, we're very fortunate that the legislation has set up extended producer responsibility, where the, the brand owners and retailers who put the products onto the market pay to get them back, collected, sorted, and recycled. How that's done varies between the European countries, but there are other mechanisms that you can do that. But we do need to include those costs into the products we use to make sure that they can be returned to the economy. That's great. The business case for collaboration. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, I saw a question earlier, Craig, on some of the initial projects that the Alliance had. Maybe you could share some yeah, insight thank, there. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so there's, there's two that we're actively working on. So just to, to um, kind of frame this a bit, there's been about 400 projects that have been submitted to the Alliance so far since we launched in January. There's an entire team that is set up to look at those, evaluate those, vet them against the four priorities of innovation, infrastructure, education, and cleanup. Uh, and then just determine that they should be funded by the central 1.5 billion that these 39 companies have made available. Uh, but just two that I like to highlight right now. Um, one is is called Renew Oceans, and it's focusing on the cleanup portion 
of our priorities. And many of you will, will already know this, that there's uh, 10 rivers that actually contribute disproportionately to the plastic waste in the ocean. And so this project is really focused on uh, those 10 rivers and engaging uh, not only in the cleanup of those rivers specifically, beginning with the Ganges in India, uh, but also education around uh, not having that leakage into the environment in the first place. Uh, and then the second one is uh, called Project Stop in Jimbrana, and that's actually working with the municipality on the infrastructure portion of our priorities to actually build out and bring infrastructure into the system so that, again, we, we avoid the leakage in the first place so that we don't actually have to get to the cleanup portion. Right. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, ben, we're going to throw this question at you here. Uh, there we are. Uh, how the most effect, how's the most effective way of changing people's mindset to participate in circular economy, or maybe in, in your case, uh, or, the I mean, GCCA? I, I think from uh, having the kids on stage earlier, just actually, you know, the passion and uh, thinking about the future and the need to act uh, is is absolutely critical. But um, I think we also, you know, uh, talked about a little bit earlier with this perception that it's expensive. Uh, it's actually just good business. Uh, and so from a, a cement and concrete perspective, you know, I've talked a little bit about how we can design to reduce the use of concrete, for example, so more efficient use of concrete by having better building information modeling so that we uh, actually don't need as much product, so therefore reducing construction costs. But uh, from a cement manufacturing perspective, for example, uh, we can actually be a consumer of waste. So there are some things that either can't be recycled now or the facilities or economy does, uh, economies of scale don't exist to do the recycling, so we can actually consume waste. Um, and uh, that, that helps uh, from a, a wider social perspective as well. So uh, I remember fairly early on in, in my days uh, at GCCA early last year, someone talking about uh, in Scandinavia there's a cement plant and people actually don't refer to it as their local cement plant, they refer to it as their local waste consumption plant. Mm -hmm. So uh, recognizing the fact that uh, we as an industry can actually make a really positive contribution, I think um, getting people to recognize things can be done differently. Uh, is very important. That's great. Well, uh, we have 10 seconds left. I'm just going to wrap up with a few of the key themes that I've heard through uh, the four introductions here. Uh, obviously, it'll do your project a, a huge favor if it is CEO-led. Um, and uh, if it does speak to that level, uh, things will, as we saw with the Alliance, move very quickly. Um, uh, it's important that there's an element of info, uh, information sharing or experience sharing uh, in these collaborations. Uh, equally as important as speaking to your CEO and, and maybe a reason why your CEO would be interested is the value chain element. So working with the rest of the value chain is increasingly important as well. Uh, an element of action. To Lily's point earlier on, we need to stop talking uh, and, and get to work uh, and, and start acting. So, and I think business is at the point where that's recognized, thus uh, initiatives like the ones on stage today uh, are, are well underway. Uh, and then lastly, there's going to be challenges with collaboration. What's really critical in order to work through those is that shared vision and having that alignment through uh, the end of the project as uh, I think everyone brought up today. So with that, uh, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists for this session and uh, Look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. And please give a big round of applause to our panelists and moderator. And thank you all very much.